an era. Yeah. It's almost like a dream. When you think about it, you think about all of the houses. Welcome to Lansing's West Side Neighborhood. Perhaps you are one of the 77,000 daily drivers who use this I-496 Olds Highway that first opened up in 1970. People who drive to work, go to their favorite restaurant, attend church, or head out of town on vacation. This 11.9 mile strip also connects countless people to Michigan State University, just east of the city. What most people don't know is that hundreds of African-American homes and businesses were destroyed so this expressway could exist. These residents and business owners had no choice in the matter. What was it like for the 6,745 people living here before and during the construction of this highway? Was it really a ghetto as was stated? Many residents have begged to differ. The, uh Nationwide at that time, you know, the freeways were all coming through the African American That's community. Right. That's right. Uh, some communities, maybe they were in uh, more distressed areas, but this area really wasn't <laughs> a distressed area. The Pave the Way Project interviewed over 100 people whose families and neighbors resided on or near St. Joseph and Main Street in Lansing, Michigan. These two streets, became ground zero in building the expressway as one of many urban renewal ventures that forever changed the landscape and a way of life that is gone but not forgotten. Historically, 1916 through 1970 was known as the Great Migration. Isabel Wilkerson, in her chronicle The Warmth of Other Suns, states that almost six million Southern blacks moved to Northern states looking for jobs and a better life. And the population of Lansing's African-Americans soared from 1,638 in 1940 to 12,234 in 1970. I came here to uh, visit, and I'm still in Lansing. Still here. Still in Lansing. And okay. Lansing. It's still a good place to raise a family, but back then it was, Lansing was a good place to raise a family. Mm -hmm. Work was plentiful. Yeah. If you wanted a job, you would find a job. Mm -hmm. Newcomers landed jobs at Oldsmobile, Fisher Body, or related suppliers which were booming in the post-World War II economy, and where middle-class dreams became reality. New cars began turning up in driveways, and nearby stores catering to the neighborhood flourished. The sacrificial homes and businesses along the expressway's path were in the predominantly African-American neighborhood along the St. Joseph and Main Street corridor, and they represented more than just real estate. It was a treasured livelihood of connections. Hardly a ghetto, it was a vibrant and thriving pocket where the majority of the city's African-Americans were forced to reside due to redlining. Despite having to face such a reality and other everyday indignities of discrimination, most managed to make a good life for themselves. Residents bragged that the close-knit neighborhood, peppered with churches, schools, and grocery stores, was a safe and friendly place to live. My name is Brenda Woods Patrick, and I grew up in Lansing at first 909 West Main Street and then our home was purchased by Friendship Baptist Church, the very first Friendship on Main Street. My name is Doris Taylor, and I grew up at uh, 1812 West Main Street. Down the street now was Myers Grocery Store, the little corner store everybody went to. Um, Melba Lewis and Val Dean and them lived right next door to us. The Hollingsworth with the white family the other side of us, which I still keep in touch with. I wasn't ghetto or Kings Accord, just the black area, you know, we had a good time. Everybody, like I said, everybody knew each other, you know, in that area. We walked 
to the, you know, all the stores. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You didn't lock your doors, and children knew they had to be home before dark. If you needed a doctor, a lawyer, barber, or beautician, all were just a short walk away. There was Shorty's gas station, right, where Mr. Cunningham... That was a pure gas station, wasn't it? Exactly, mm-hmm. pure oil. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of that little parking lot there at Butler and St. Joe was Schmidt's Grocery Store. That's correct. Katie Corner across from the gas station was Stone's Pharmacy. Mm-hmm. And apparently uh, uh, the Muslims had a fish place someplace behind where Schmidt's used to be. I can't remember it, but everybody is just amazed that I'm the only black person that grew up on the west side that doesn't have memories of I'm the <laughs> so Do you remember a uh, live store? Oh, I love North. 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 And I can remember that our neighborhood was friendly, um, that I could really play and skip outside without being called back home. I remember um, the big school and I remember the big street at that time. And I knew also that um, with help, I could cross the street and go down to my Aunt Leela's house. (laughs) And uh, fun is one of the first uh, adjectives that came to my mind. we could run up and down the street till the street lights came on. That was it. And I could be at <laughs> I could be at Val's house or Barb or uh, Faye's house and feel safe. My parents did not mind me being at those homes. Uh, we could sleep on our front porch mm. without um, locking our front doors. So fun and safe. Okay. Yeah, I was, my experience with that area was I, I grew up and lived there until third grade. But what I was saying was when I, when I left Sparrow Hospital, I was taken to 912 South Butler, which was the home of my father's grandmother. We lived there as a family, I mean our whole family unit, it was like my mother and father, me and my sister, and we lived at Big Mama's house. Till me and my sister got too big to be in the same room. Well, there was a pharmacy on the corner. Next to the pharmacy was a hardware store. Remember them poles? You remember seeing them poles? They had them cane poles sticking out there. In the summertime, to me, it was a little kid. It was fascinating, because they would lean cane poles uh, up there. That's when folks used to fish in the Grand River. Come by and bring Miss Jones a bucket of fish. Cats been caught so many fish they couldn't eat them all. Right. On a summer night in the St. Joseph Main Street neighborhood, the sounds of children playing games mixed with the pounding drop forge and music drifting from open windows of nearly every home. On a clear night with an east wind, you might even hear the lion roaring at the Potter Park Zoo. Jazz, blues, rock, soul, and gospel, the cacophony of sounds melded together, filling the streets. When you hear people talk about the village, we really did have a village. We all knew each other and we all interacted with one another. We really respected our neighbors and we looked out for each other. And if we needed anything, and actually, I remember Mr. Snail coming over and borrowing a cup of sugar and a couple of sticks of margarine. Just like the, the cliche, <laughs> like the cliche mm-hmm. yes. Wow. <laughs> she was baking a cake and she ran out of sugar and she didn't have any margarine. She was she was already starting on the cake. So. You, you don't do that now. You got, and we didn't lock our doors. We didn't lock our doors. No. Our front door was open all summer long. But, but we, rode our, we rode our bikes. We didn't know where we were at. We got lost. So for somehow we stopped by the radio person. We was by the blind school, which we thought was out of town. <laughs> and my mother heard it on the radio that we were lost. <laughs> no, Barbara, we were out, we had walked from the skating rink out to Lake Lansing. But this was on our bikes. Oh. We done a lot of stuff, Faith. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some, yeah. No, I can't tell it on camera. You had to be in before the street lights came on. It didn't matter if you came in two minutes after the street lights came on. 
you were told to be in before the street lights came. It, it, there was no excuse for that. <laughs> it, there was no way to judge. You could be the best lawyer in the world, but you couldn't talk your way out of that one. Because <laughs> they didn't, parents didn't play. No. What they told you is what they meant. And they backed it up, too. Employment at the local Oldsmobile factory, Atlas and Lindell Forge plants, and government jobs were becoming more and more available not to mention small cell phone businesses and side hustles that made ends meet. Many owned their own homes outright or were buying them via land contracts. That all changed July 5th, 1965, when a bulldozer crushed the home of Joyce B. Fair at 2010 West Main Street. This was the first of 600 homes and businesses destroyed to make way for the new Crosstown Expressway. We're going to explore what life was like in this neighborhood before I-496, a bustling neighborhood where proud residents pursued the American dream. At the end of our backyard was the beginning of Lincoln School's playground. Yeah, but it was a big Do you side. remember Lincoln School at yeah, all? Vaguely. That was a very like, prominent example. Was just okay, scared. well... Lincoln School comes in because, to me, it was like a early community center. Some of the benefits of living in a so-called liberal society uh, in Michigan in that time, now I say liberal quote-unquote because the, the idea was get them niggas everything they need so they don't ask us for shit and be right. coming over. In our right, 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 right. So at this, uh, it was, Lincoln School was a grade school that had a stage, a full kitchen, a gymnasium. They taught adult ed classes, home ed classes, music classes. All that. Oh, hey, man, look, it was no. great. It was no. great, great environment. It really was. You know, I mean, I loved it. In 1962, Frank Spagnola, owner of Spags, a party store, sponsored the first Pop Warner League tackle football team in the neighborhood. Frank Spagnola started a football team. And uh, all of us in the whole community, we went out to try out for that team and we had one of the best teams. We had a real good team. We beat everybody. The Spag Falcons became one of the dominant teams and on weekends would draw 400 to 800 cheering fans. Joel Ferguson, Sherman Bennett, and Dick Lipscomb were the first coaches. There were no blacks playing Little League football. Okay. And Did they have a, they had a program? Little Sparks. They had a program. He's we racing at the Little Sparks. Okay. okay. But suits they, there. We, there were no blacks playing and me and Dick Lipscomb formed the Blackhawks. Yep. And Spags uh, was our sponsor. store. You know Spags? And, yeah. and we had we didn't have enough money to we got bought the uniforms but it's too funny we we didn't have enough money for everything so me and dick decided we wouldn't have hip pads <laughs> you know well shoot we were already faster than the team you know, without the hip pads everybody was uh, hip pads so we went you were my coach yeah we played on sunday at st joe park there was probably six seven teams all white. Some of the teams had a player or two. Mine was solid black. Frank Spagnola, who was white, remembers opening his store on a Monday morning and talking with Dr. Clinton Kennedy, who dropped by most mornings on his way to his nearby office. I opened my store at 9 o'clock. I'd open up, we'd walk in, We'd talk about if the Lions played or whoever, and the phone rang. Hello, and it's a lady. You, Frank Spagnola, yeah. You're the one that sponsors all the niggers. I said, what? He says, yeah, we're going to burn your store down. We're going to burn your house down. Why are you, why don't you? Sponsor Mike, it went on, 
And then I, I don't know what to say. Dr. Kennedy's standing there like he always does on Monday morning. And I says, he could tell that something was going on. And I hung up, I said, that lady's going to burn my store down, my house down, because I have a black team. And his, I will never forget his words. See, Frank, that's what we put up with all the time. Many local black-owned businesses, which thrived in the neighborhood, were lost forever to the expressway. There was Wright's Grocery, which featured a Polish dog, a bag of Jay's potato chips, and a Tahitian treat pop for 35 cents. Wright's was located between Sexton High School and West Junior High School, so it was a popular place after school and at lunch. There was barbecue, confectionery shops, and Fred and Bill's, which specialized in roasted chicken. Silver Bell's Bakery was the place for pastries. Matthew's was also a popular place because of their foot-long hot dogs. For the residents of the West Side community, grocery stores were always only a few minutes away. Those included Knack Fours, Far Hats Groceries, and Kalush, a favorite place to pick up a Polish dog, Chitlins, and Greens. The weekly family grocery shopping was also done at Saveway, Schmidt's, and Goodrich's. A number of fine stores catered to the clothing needs of the neighborhood. Let's Fashions was located on St. Joseph Street, but was forced to move when the expressway came through. African American women sought out Let's for their elegant wedding dresses and cotillion gowns, but it was also frequented by women working in nearby state offices. King's Clothing was one of the few clothing stores which catered to African Americans, allowing the entire family to use a charge account. Cadillac Clothes was where men went to buy popular band outfits. The Lansing Civic Center hosted Motown groups as well as jazz legends. Young people from the neighborhood would stream to these events after buying tickets at Johnny's Record Shop on Logan Street, where they also went to listen to new releases and buy products no one else sold, like tinted nylons and hair treatments. Before there was a term Afro Afro-American, Johnny had the Afrocentric store, which covered everything. I mean, this was a very modern, progressive rug. He augmented his thing by offering pantyhose, when this was when pantyhose first broke out. And they didn't have the colors for the black women, where you could go buy them at the other store. So Johnny had all of this stuff for the sisters. Johnny would pull out the catalog for your little snap brim hats right. and the straws, all the hats his brothers here would either have to go to Chicago or Detroit to That's buy. Right. That's right. Johnny had the catalog for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, he did. You know, and you just put down some cash and order it up, come back later and get it. You know, it's like, hey. Um, so yeah, wonderful memories of Johnny's record store. Most white dry cleaners would not accept clothes from African Americans at that time. So black residents had to turn to Russell's Cleaners, Jones Cleaners, Paramount Cleaners, and ABC Cleaners in the neighborhood. Numerous white-owned businesses also called the neighborhood home, including Spagnola's Liquor Store, Vets Hardware, and Stone's Pharmacy, which hired the neighborhood's first African American pharmacist, Samuel Hosey. African-American entrepreneurs were common in the neighborhood. These included Faye Lett, founder of a heating and cooling company, Rankin Lewis, one of the first garbage services in Lansing, and Bird Standard Service, the first African-American owned service station in Lansing. There were more than 20 beauty shops and barbershops scattered throughout the neighborhood, with exotic names like Fashionette and the Birdcage Beauty Salon. Robert Husband was one of these entrepreneurs that had a hair shop. When the expressway forced his business to close, it was difficult for him to get loans to reopen. African-American entrepreneurship was seriously set back by the construction of the expressway. 
Due to the city of Lansing's openly racist policies, many African-American entrepreneurs simply were not allowed to thrive outside of the neighborhood that was soon to be destroyed. We were in business, uh, I had a barbershop on Butler Street a long time ago, but in that barbershop upstairs, I had an upstairs barbershop, downstairs we made it into a restaurant called the Barbecue Pit. Oh yeah, I remember that. Remember Barbecue Pit? Yeah, I do remember okay, that. Okay, that was my, me and my brothers owned that. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I and uh, that. Uh, we had that going on. We knew we had to move from uh, there on St. Joseph because of the highway. And we, we worked at we worked at a restaurant. And uh, we didn't take any money for ourselves. We just saved all the money. And uh, so we had uh, went down to city planning. Mm -hmm and asked the city planning, we had seen some houses that may be for sale on, on the north side of St. Joe, uh, near the Sycamore area, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and asked them verbally, uh, would it be a, would, how, how, how hard would it be to get this area commercialized uh, for, for business, because we're going to be uprooted by the, by the highway. Right. And they said it, it wouldn't be any, didn't think it would be any problem. So anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, Saved all our money and uh, bought some houses there on, on the north side of St. Joe near Sycamore Street mm -hmm. and tore them down. We didn't have any money. If we bought it, we didn't have any money to have them tore down mm -hmm. uh, by bulldozers or by sure. somebody else. So we had to tear them down ourselves, nail for nail. We tore them down ourselves, the houses. Now yeah. you saying we, you and who? My brothers. Okay, all right. All my brothers, five brothers. Are you kidding me? And we tore it down. Tore those houses, about three houses we tore down. And then we had a builder uh, uh, that was going to build this plaza for us, like a building mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. We had commitments from a lot of the businesses in that corridor that would rent from us once they was uprooted by the highway. Because Faye Lass and all them was down there too, wasn't it? Yeah, Faye Lass was up and down there. They had drug stores, they had hardware stores, That's they right. had That's all right. kinds of stores That's there, right. you know. And so we tore those houses down. and. We went back, after we tore them down, we went down to City Hall to uh, City Planning get a permit and to get a permit to, to do this. They, they they just told us no. You know why? Yeah, I know why. downtown. And we were black. And you were black. The excuse they had was that the plans for the highway had been changed and there was going to be uh, an exit there coming up where we had bought this property. Right. And the traffic would be too congested in that area to put any kind of business in, in that area. So they cut us down. They, they, they just told us flat, no, we couldn't do it. We lost there. We lost everything there. And I cried like a baby because we couldn't get it back. Where's the exit at? Uh, never came, did it? Never came. Never came. So, but it was hard for us to uh, to get any kind of financing. And uh, and the girl mother was going to help us out. <laughs> but after that, that's why we don't have any black businesses in here. Now you can't get financing. When we were advised that we could get a television, no, I'm sorry, a radio station, we, that was to Ernie Boone, Bob Williams, myself, and Cullen DeBose, the three of us. We went to the bank. Jim Herrick was the president of the bank. Mm -hmm. He told us that we could extend you a loan because you're creditable people, you have uh, jobs, etc. If we do, we don't want you to play any of that jungle music. Wow. <laughs> That's uppermost in my thoughts, man. Mm. We left there depressed. Yeah. More than 10 churches in the extended neighborhood near I-496 were forced to regroup and move. Friendship Baptist Church was a pillar of the community. And, and you mentioned friendship, we were members of friendship. And I, I still recall and I share the story that during those days, Main Street and West St. Joe was like a fashion show every Sunday you had. Because most folks didn't have cars, or at least they didn't have two. So you had everyone walking down Main Street or St. Joe, headed to Union or headed to Friendship. The ladies were so beautiful, they would stop traffic because they had their hats and their heels 
and their son be passed on. That's right. And it was just, it's a beautiful remembrance uh, to think about that. The cornerstone on Friendship Baptist Church reads, dedicated to God and the community, 1956. That's, that's important. That says yeah, a lot. That's because we didn't have access to the master plan. That says a lot. Because those black folks built a fine church. Sure did. As fine a church as, they were. as anybody could build. They Period. did not spare expense. That's right. They had no idea that within 10 years, the community they had dedicated that church to was poof. And it had already been planned. We just didn't know it. That's right. But that's it's planned while they're building the church. <laughs>Across the United States, the practice of destroying neighborhoods made up of black, brown, and marginalized populations is well documented. A long history of discrimination made these neighborhoods the target for expressways and other public projects. Federal, state, and local practices routinely undervalued property in these neighborhoods, where residents were less organized and had little political or economic clout. They were easy targets for eminent domain. In the 1950s, President Dwight Eisenhower launched our interstate highway program. We now know overwhelmingly, though, that our urban freeways were routed through low-income and minority communities. And so instead of connecting, and connecting us to each other, in some ways our highways have represented a separation. Now, if you lived in an area slated for a highway project, you had to move and that also had severe impacts for people and for families. Remember, a lot of this activity and a lot of the decisions were made prior to the federal civil rights legislation, prior to the Voting Rights Act, and so uh, decision makers really thought of low-income and minority communities as, in, in many ways, the communities of least resistance. And uh, that's reflected in how the transportation system was built in the early days. The man who envisioned the highway system was the longtime director of the former U.S. Bureau of Public Roads, Thomas McDonald. And he said that his goal was to get farmers out of the mud, a very worthy goal, by the way. In a speech to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, McDonald advocated displacing people in order to get those farmers out of the mud. And he said that destroying low-income areas with highways would in effect serve a higher and more legitimate purpose, converting them into a public asset. McDonald had a compatriot in Robert Moses, the country's infamous highway designer. These were the leading voices in the country as the highway movement took off in its early days, and their views were widely embraced and took root all over America. We actually took a look at total household displacement in the first 20 years of the construction of the interstate system and we found that a majority of people displaced were in fact people of color. And if you add urban renewal programs on top of that, roughly two-thirds of the families displaced were low income, and many of those were African American. People were forced to sell their homes at below market value, taking their main source of wealth. Many still live on the edges of our freeways, and of course they paid a heavy price, but I would argue now the rest of us are paying a heavy price for this um, displacement. It's imperative that we acknowledge that these divisions, past and present, still exist. We still live with them. And that the concrete and steel and asphalt in this country plays a role in how people connect themselves to opportunity. Arguably, expressways reduce the massive traffic jams that besiege cities. In Lansing, this was very prevalent at shift changes for Oldsmobile, or MSU versus U of M game days. City planners and elected officials predicted that cities would boom as a result of new expressways. Expressways can be traced back to early bicyclists whose big wheels could not navigate the muddy rut-ridden roads of the late 1800s. Later, Michigan's Highway Commissioner Horatio Goodroads Earl led the first major road improvement project in Michigan during the early 1900s. In 1919, after World War I, Lieutenant Colonel Dwight Eisenhower 
who would later become president, experienced just how bad roads were in the United States. He led a cross-country excursion from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco that took 62 days and caused lots of broken axles. During the 1920s, New York City's developer Robert Moses started a national movement to develop parkways in cities that displaced thousands of the poor, minorities, and the disenfranchised. The 1939 New York World's Fair became an important motivator for building highways. Millions of visitors to the General Motors Futurama exhibit took a ride on the magic motorways. More than 3.5 million astonished visitors were captivated by the prospects of what lay ahead. They left wearing lapel buttons proclaiming, I have seen the future, and a desire to see magic motorways back at home. Auto companies and builders across the country began lobbying and spending millions of dollars to convince the populace that expressways were needed. The magnitude of this galvanized effort involving builders, city planners, and government at that time was totally unprecedented. When Eisenhower became president in 1953, he immediately began promoting a highway system in the U.S. to rival the German Autobahn, which he had rode to victory in World War II. In addition to promoting safety and convenience, he sold the highway system to Americans by using Cold War threats of nuclear war. He claimed expressways would enable residents to evacuate cities if the bomb was dropped. The first indication Lansing was targeted for an expressway appeared in a 1955 yellow book published by the U.S. Department of Commerce. In it was a collection of maps detailing general locations of interstates traversing 80 major U.S. cities. This map of Lansing shows a proposed expressway running through the St. Joseph and Main Street corridor. That same path appeared in Lansing's 1958 community plan, and in 1961, the Lansing City Council approved the expressway location. And they took it to the cheapest way they could go, through our neighborhoods. It's a white sky too now. This was a common practice in a number of black communities where they, I, I can speak to it, I'm from Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, if you ever ever heard of Black Wall Street, mm -hmm. yes, yes, okay. yeah. yes, that's historical. Yes, it is. They put that through Black Wall Street to tear up and destroy the black neighborhood. This is common in every major city that you are aware of. Wow. No, this wasn't by accident. And yeah, what, what's so it's black is? removal? It is that's what it's called. Well, if you'll notice, basically, oftentimes if you go through cities. Well, they were doing this highway, the uh, this inter, 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 interstate. Mm -hmm. Mostly, you could look out and off the expressway and, and the poor neighborhoods. You go through Detroit, or you go through Chicago. Washington D.C. You go through the black neighborhoods. Right. You go through the poor neighborhoods because it's easier to take the, the, the property. You're not going to go through the suburbs. So you go, you know, you look and say, "Well, why does it have to go this way?" <laughs> you know, they're moving through, winding through the city. Why couldn't you just go straight through? Uh, the suburbs straight, that's a straight line, you go right on through. You no, know, you wind on through and you look out and you have industry, industry, and you have the, the, you know, the poor areas. And that's, what, that's, that's the way they did it. In 1964, federal, state, and local officials announced that the construction of I-496 would begin in 1965 the first notice to evacuate properties would also start. The total cost of the construction was approximately $31 million. But how much more did it actually cost other than dollars and cents? One of the worst things you can do is if you have two little schools side by side competing in sports. This one is a dead enemy of this one. Cut through a chunk of this one off and leave it over with this one. <laughs> you know uh, what had happened and it did. don't ever split a neighborhood <laughs> if you can help it. When you split that neighborhood up, uh, you lose legacy, okay? 
and some people would have been able to stay in those areas where they could afford at that time instead of moving to places where they couldn't afford or eventually couldn't afford and they could have passed those on through the family those those homes and the, that property can be passed on through the family through generations having to leave an area that you were accustomed to and you knew everybody mm -hmm. and everybody knew you you know i'm sure it was quite you know painful mm -hmm. <laughs> to have to uh, go through that they started building 496 in 1965. I was in kindergarten. Mm. My parents didn't have a problem with it, but I did. I lost a lot of my friends. When they tore down, I lost a lot of friends. Mm. I didn't like 496. Okay. You see, all my friends moved to the south side where they didn't want us, but yeah, they moved over there. Okay. Actually, that was very disturbing to us as a, um, as a neighborhood because we were separated from our friends some of us, um, I know my father had a, had a garden there, but it wasn't at our house because the houses there were like the A-frame houses. And he had to leave that garden, which took him out of his, out of his element, which when, when they moved over to the south side, he had to find another place, which was larger. And then being separated from where we raised our family, it, it did have something to do with him, and he didn't live too much longer after we moved out of that area. My mom and my dad, I was young, my mom and my dad, I would hear them talking about it. You know, they really didn't know how to, um, they really didn't know how to deal with the move because they had never been through with it before from being from down south. So they really had to get help in trying to relocate and sell their house because they didn't have the education of how to go through real estate. Homer Hawkins was a young PhD student at MSU looking for an idea for his dissertation when his wife visited a beautician in the St. Joseph Main Street Corridor and learned about the dislocation and its impact. Hawkins became very interested and decided that story would be the foundation for his dissertation. To this day, it is the only contemporaneous history of what residents thought about the expressway taking their homes and forcing them to move. Dr. Hawkins interviewed more than 70 residents when the move was foremost in their minds. Okay, so I go in and I talk to him. He says, I felt bad, I still do. I got treated like a convict. There ain't no warden and I ain't no... Uh, they ain't no warden, I ain't no convict. We got kicked out in the street. We were pushed out in the street. We were like rats looking for a hole. And that ain't right. No way is that right. I was angry, depressed, disgusted, and unhappy, and some other bad feelings. You name it, I was that. I just got back on the job. I was off for four years with a broken knee. And then they, they come in long and take, my, take, our, take our house. I fought it like anybody would have fought it. But they told me if, I, if we didn't get our furniture, we would be put. It, it, it would be put in the street, and the bulldozer would tear up, would tear the house down. What kind of treatment is that? No way, no way is that right. As I think of what happened, I feel bad all over again. If we had stayed at the, in, in the other place, I would have had the place paid for in four years from now. I'll never pay for this place. I guess you could say that I'm heartbroken, man. My heart is broke. In thinking about my friends and the nice times we had, I really feel bad that we didn't get together like we used to. When they started tearing down the neighborhood, it was like a tornado, but it was just wasn't as fast. No one knew what was going to happen to them. You didn't know what your best friends were going, where they were going, and you didn't know where you were going. It was like a very bad ending to a very happy story. I still think about the good times we used to have. And you know, we seldom see these people anymore, and this is really sad and depressing. Everybody was so close and you could look to your neighbors for help. So that's that's the kind of thing that um, kind of sets the pace for how people were feeling. Right? When daddy found out that we had to leave mm -hmm. 1001 St. Joe, mm -hmm. when daddy found out we had to move, mm -hmm. what did what did he say? What did you guys talk about? Was he mad, hurt, upset? Oh, he was mad. He said, you don't own nothing. Mm. And when the uh, police said we had to move, they said, gave us four months. 
And if you didn't remove your house or tear it down, they would come along and smash it. <coughs> they did not want our houses. They wanted the land so they could bring the highway through. I left Lansing uh, in 1965. The first year I went to uh, Western, I came back in the summer of 66. And, you know, uh, nostalgia or whatever, curiosity, I wanted to see, because I knew that things was happening on the west side. <clears throat> And I got back and the house was there, but it was vacant. And it was just... The house on Butler? Yeah, okay. the house on Butler Street was still vacant. Uh, but it was still there. And it was just kind of, you know, ghostly because most of the other houses by that time were gone. It was obvious, like, you know, area in, in destruction. I came uh, and searched it out when I got back home the next summer of 67 and they had leveled the whole block and it was a parking lot. <laughs> in fact, Not funny, like, but funny. Yeah, it was a whole, the whole block parking lot. It was like, bam, it was gone. But I could still kind of remember trying to fit the house in its space, you know. But then 68, come home the summer of 68 and all I could think of was they took the dirt away. That's really, I gotta remember that. They took the dirt away. They took the dirt away. You know, and it was just space. So then I had to put the house in space. Wow. <laughs> We're talking space age stuff, right? Right, right. Talking about right. living in the space age, yeah. Well, the fact that when they finally took all the dirt away, it made it even more profound about being uh, a feeling of disconnected, you know, or just disjointed. It was like a, a, a connection I'd had all my life was gone. I mean, it was like, like boom, poo. Like I said, it got me was, <laughs> they took the dirt away, bro. I mean... <laughs> Residents of the West Side neighborhood called the expressway path the Big Ditch. It dipped 20 feet below grade. More than 2 million cubic yards of dirt was moved east and west of downtown to fill in swamp-like land. You know, people would go back and look at the hole. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty traumatic. And, and you know, just like when you see these tornadoes and these, it's like this paradise fire, and, and these people look like they got a, a, Deer in the headlights, and that's, that's what these people, that's what they were feeling. And it was just a slow rip off. And, and to come in and tell you you're gonna move, we're gonna make you move, and you don't have a choice. And that was it, get out. The construction of I 496 pretty much went according to plan, with very little problems in production. What didn't go so well was the relocation of hundreds of African American families. There was no place to move to. African Americans could only live in certain neighborhoods due to discriminatory real estate practices. Once residents sold their home, they had only 45 days to pack and find a place to live. Signs sprouted up on lawns about overcrowding and the damage to the family structure. But as always, they fought back individually and collectively to circumvent the dire circumstances. Hundreds of families were placed in temporary rental housing provided by the state of Michigan. Others found new homes of their own in the near West Side neighborhood, while others sought homes in the South Lansing neighborhoods of Churchill Downs and Coachlight subdivisions. In retrospect, it is now painfully obvious that most of these displaced African American families were herded into certain areas of town due to racist, redlining procedures. Not every homeowner agreed with the price they were offered for their home and hired attorneys to argue their cases. Residents of the neighborhood Rudy Wilson and Cullen DuBose went door to door warning residents not to be lowballed on their home's value. The NAACP eventually interceded. 
first winning relocation expenses for those being displaced. It also argued there were discriminatory practices between white and African Americans in prices being offered for their homes. Uh, Rudy Wilson and Cullen Dubos, <laughs> right, uh, really were advocates on uh, the residents trying to, once it was determined that they weren't going to be able to stop it, that they got fair value for their properties because uh, the feeling was they were greatly undervaluing the properties when the free went came through. Colin Dubos mm -hmm. who came from Virginia. No, it was Virginia, it was Louisiana as a engineer. And he was hired as an engineer. But he, Rudy Wilson, and Dubos were the ones that went door to door telling people not to sell their houses until they had it looked at by a real estate company because they was screwing folks and they, they scared the black folks. And so they were selling the house, they were almost giving them away, they were so scared. Mm -hmm. but there was no consideration, in my opinion, given to the people which was being relocated, okay? Mm -hmm. And when they came through, Rudy is the one who, who, um, advocated for the blacks to get their value from their homes. Oh, for, for the 496 period? No, for 496 when it came through because they were trying to sell it cheaply. Right. But Rudy had a white contact at MDOT who told him. So he's the one who went around speaking to the people that were affected, telling them to hold out so that they were not getting pennies on the dollar. Oh, I didn't know that. At that time, uh, in the 50s, early, late 50s, early 60s, how was it for blacks here in Lansing? Was it, was it really racist, really prejudiced? Or? Oh, it was prejudiced. Uh, you know, when I started going into New York, buying uh, merchandise for my store, one time I, got, I was getting on a plane coming home, and I was thinking to myself, once I get on this plane, I'm going to be in a very prejudiced world again. In New York City, there was no prejudice. Mm. You were just one of the many, you know. Right, right. And uh, but Lansing, Michigan, was a different, different world. And you know what? I felt so terrible when I came, and my black customers could not ride on the bus with me. I felt horrible, and they could not drink out of a fountain that yeah. I drank out of. And I felt terrible. I love my customers. And 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 they, okay, that happened when you when when we were little. They, I mean, they when, what are you what are you talking about? Me. They had that to go in the bus. Wasn't that in Colorado? And, no, that's here. And then. What you talking about the fifties? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I did not know that nobody could buy a house in East Lansing. No black folks could buy a house mm -hmm. in East Lansing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's just amazing to me. Yeah. And, you know, people thought because we lived in the North that none of that, that stuff was going on, you know. Since the turn of the century, discriminatory practices in Lansing limited the locations where African Americans could live. Nationwide and locally, realtors and public officials conspired to force African Americans into less desirable locations near smoke-spewing factories, noisy rail lines, and polluted rivers. All three were adjacent to the St. Joseph Main Street neighborhood. The use of redlining, named for the red shading on city maps used to delineate so-called hazardous neighborhoods of color and the foreign-born, can be traced back to the 1930s when the Homeowners Loan Corporation used local realtors to act as appraisers in most major cities. They raided neighborhoods with colors, red being the worst and green being the best. An underwriting manual was published detailing how banks should administer loans. Banks were told to refer to the rating maps which precluded certain areas of the cities from most loan programs because of what was considered perceived risk. Redlining, combined with sweeping restrictive clauses in deeds, excluded minorities from owning homes in most new subdivisions. Some new neighborhoods went as far as erecting concrete barriers around the so-called hazardous areas. 
The manual also suggested that highways were an option for separating the races. The underwriting manual was brief and to the point. It stated, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. In addition, the Lansing State Journal and other newspapers ran realtor-sponsored colored-only house-for-sale ads furthering discriminatory practices. Lansing realtors were leaders in supporting a failed constitutional amendment that would have allowed discriminatory housing practices. I remember, but by that time, a whole lot of people were moving to the south side. I don't know what took that transition, what made them do that, but that was a Yeah, that's where they were steered to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were certain areas that you couldn't live in, yeah. so they forced you basically to go to the south side. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I recall one of our members, and I will not name them, but one of our members at uh, Friendship during that time said, and, and, and they had to really trust the people. He was working at Rio, and he had one of his white co-workers purchase the house for them because they would not sell the house to them. Now, you really had to trust somebody to put your money into some property. In somebody else's name. In somebody else's name that's not even a relative and not have them taken from you. We uh, bought our first house in 1954 on St. Joe Street uh, and thought we would live there for 10 years, maybe longer. Uh, in fact, we had no no urge to move out of the neighborhood at all. It was a nice neighborhood. It was an integrated neighborhood at the time. Excellent. And then what happened in 1965, and um, it, particularly how did you feel when you received the letter from Mishta requiring you to, to really just up and leave? Well, that was really a surprise. You know, said we had planned on living there. We had done things to our home. We had made it our home after purchasing it. Uh, so that meant that was, you know, nine, ten years later, and suddenly we find out that um, there's going to be uh, a highway. Uh, constructed through there. Now I know that highways were linked, you know, from one state to another and that sort of thing, but we never really gave it a thought that it would happen to us. Uh, and then we started receiving the notifications, you know, that um, that a highway was going to be constructed, that it was going to be I-496, uh, etc. Um, our children were in school by that time, in the elementary school. Uh, and then also we had a younger daughter at the time. So she was an infant when we started receiving this information. So it, it was upsetting. Um, it, it was totally shocking, let me put it that way, because it wasn't anything that we had thought would be in our future plans. Mary Jane and Cyril McGuire had first-hand knowledge of discriminatory real estate practices. When they found their home was in the path of the I-496 Expressway, they began looking for a new home to raise their family. After Mary Jane located a suitable home in Lansing's Grosbeck neighborhood, she brought Cyril by to look at the home. Cyril was a UAW official at the time and was much darker than the light-skinned Mary Jane. And upon seeing Cyril, the realtor had a no Negroes clause added to the listing. Mary Jane and Cyril McGuire were among those who took a stand about the price they were offered for their home. A protracted legal case resulted in an additional award. When the final paperwork was signed, Mary Jane and Cyril took their children on vacation so they would not have to watch their home being torn down. Most residents interviewed for this project have little recollection of their home being torn down. Dr. Homer Hawkins attributes this partially to PTSD. We grieve loss. And um, like I say, you go through uh, you go through shock or d shock denial, those kinds of things. That process, and 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 hopefully you get, get you know go all the way back to acceptance. Bargaining is in there too, but there's no bargaining when somebody takes your house. You say uh, a lot of times you say, what, "What if I'd have done this differently? What would have happened?" They don't get to that point. Uh, a lot of these people that were were moved, who lost their homes. 
never got past anger and depression. Mm -hmm. They never got to acceptance. So, yeah. And, and, and that was, uh, and see, first of all, <clears throat> in order to replace what you had, you had to either liquidate your savings or take less than what you had. And either way, that makes you very angry. People don't realize that many of the houses that were torn down were paid off. Yep. People no longer had a mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister, my mom, and my cousin, and her mother paid off. All paid off. So, in essence, people talked about it. They met in the churches about it. They talked among themselves about it. But they didn't know politically what to do right. about it. Right. And so not having any political directions what to do about it, because the churches also were being moved. Yep. But a lot of people felt like the money that they were getting for these facilities would help them start again. It did. But when you didn't have a mortgage anymore, mm -hmm. they didn't realize that starting again meant that they were at the mercy of the lenders. Yep. They were at the mercy of the banks. And most of them was not aware of how the banks and the lenders negotiate interest rates because they never had that problem right. before. Did you get the impression that the city of Lansing did enough to help people move? No. No. Um... No. <laughs> he said emphatically. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> what part of no? There was, there was a, a newspaper article um, talking about what the city leaders did, and they basically said, we won't have to do anything because they'll find their own homes, they'll find their own way. Well, just like when I was reading that Mr. L, he said they were like rats trying to find a hole. That was it. We had four months to get rid of our house on St. Jer or anything we wanted in it. But if you want, had enough money and wanted to have your house moved to another area, you could. But how many black people on West St. Joe had $13,000? Right, that's like hey, to move the cash. Right. So my husband, oh, he had put so much in it and so many others, people we knew, people were screaming and scrambling and trying to save what was inside that was valuable to you. He said, I'm not even looking. I'm not moving. We've got to move, we've got to move, but it's up to you. Mm. On December 20th, 1970, Miss Michigan Highways, riding in a 1904 curved dash Oldsmobile, opened the final stretch between US 127 and Clare Street by crashing through a paper barrier proclaiming Oldsmobile Expressway. Some 50 years later, the expressway has been renamed Olds Highway. Ironically, a Toronado, in part built by African American workers, and one of the most popular cars ever produced by Oldsmobile, was used to break through a celebration banner at the opening of the I-496 Oldsmobile Expressway. What wasn't said at that opening celebration was the horrendous impact the path of the expressway had on ordinary people, especially the hundreds of African American families who were forced to move, losing a substantial amount of capital they had invested in their homes. We just grew up in all that neighborhood, went to the stores, went to the drop-in center, all of that was taken away from us. What they did to us is this, this took, look how, look how many houses they took between the state buildings and Oldsmobile and the highway, they took the whole west side out. Right. Look how many voters that have been. Yeah. You know, and since some way south, the little homes they sold us over the church and down there, but, I mean, it's con it's compared it's to homes that, were, that mm -hmm. we left. Right. They had fireplaces in them and, you know, I mean. Hardwood floors. Hardwood floors. Well, that's kind of our ultimate question to go here today is, do you think that they consciously redlined in those days that 496? Oh, yeah. Do you think it was needed expressway? Well, they needed expressway. They really needed expressway, but they could have went other way with that expressway. They could have went around the city and dropped in. Right. You know. It did not occur to me that uh, the path of the freeway 
was anything other than where it should have gone to get from A to B. Right. Do I think it was redlining now? Mm -hmm. Yes, as an adult, do you look back at that and oh, say, yeah. purpose? Hell yeah. 496, I'm sure, was a was a big deal for whoever was, you know, pushing the project. Uh, I can't help but think that uh, those people that lived on that track on both sides, you know, Main Street and St. Joe in the middle of that, uh, were not really, you know, a big part of that thought process. Where are you? Where are you? What's that? Look, it's a, it's a hole in the ground. Who did that? Why they do that? It's a hole in the ground. Where's my mother? Where's my father? It's a hole in the ground. Where's the kids running about? It's a what? An expressway? An expressway to where? took my land. What we gonna go to? Not here, not there. Where was I? I feel all alone. Once a hood full of aunts and uncles, moms, dads, kids running about. What? What? What's that hole for? The hole in the ground. ground. 